just more or less given a free hand and Ginny started that in the coaching of the team and what he wanted to do. And right from the beginning, as I said, was, we were confident and we felt we were going all the way. It was a great thrill and I don't think anything would, would surpass it, but up alongside it must come the fact that I was the previous year, 1972, uh, Nemo won their first title and I was captain of that. And in 1973, May 1973, we won the All-Ireland Club title for the first time in which I was captain. So, I mean, they were tremendous thrills for me, obviously, the uh, Captain Cork um, to 73, and particularly after 20 years, was huge. And, um, you know, I'm very proud of that. Was it a natural thing for you to go into management then and take over the Cork team? Well, I was very interested in coaching and um, in coaching methods and, and that so. It was probably natural then that I would follow on, um, as I said, I was um, coaching him up at the time, practically that I went, I went to America in 1982, um, and when I came back, I was offered the job, I think, in 19, but I wanted to do it, I, I won't deny that, I wanted it because during my time as a player with Cork, um, I felt we always had the players and felt we were good enough for anybody, but I felt we were mismanaged most of the time, obviously not in Donny Dunwin's time, uh, but that we were mismanaged and there was no real um, purpose above a lot of it that, that, that selectors were elected just for the sake of filling posts and they had no real interest in us succeeding, didn't believe we could anyway. So I must admit I wanted to take it um, and believed I could do something during my time. I always believed um, we would win in All Ireland um, because I have to admit as well I was lucky um, I, the players were there. Mm. Um, we can't look the same person as far as here and the players were there. Um, but having lost the finals of 87 and 88 and particularly with losing the 88 final um, you know a little doubt creeps in is there a jinx on us, but um, as I said, I really did believe that that team were good enough to win, and we did. We won the Dublin 89 and not all in the 90, and perhaps we should have won a little bit more, but then again, um, we could say that about a lot of things. Did you ever feel that there was a lot of unnecessary hassle in your direction when you were in charge and you were successful? Well, um, yeah, uh, I thought. Going back from an early period, there, there was a lot of unnecessary, unnecessary hassle directed in my, in my direction. Like, even going back as far as I know, you know this or not, um, in 1979, um, I was a player at the time, but the selectors approached me to coach the team um, and proposed my name at a county board meeting and it was shut down. Uh, it was the first time it ever happened. and. Um, eventually a, a compromise came about where um, Frank Cogan was um, made trainer and I was coach, something to that effect. All I was looking for wanted was the best for top football and as I said at that stage I believed um, that we were good enough, or as good as anything in the country, if properly managed. And then of course you, you, you remember 1991 um, when uh, for some reason, well, I know the reasons, um, they tried to get rid of me. Um, and if they, in fact, at that time, if they kept their mouth shut, I was thinking of packing it in anyway. Cause I, but, um, I mean, that was unbelievable at the time, and it, it was a, a fairly tra traumatic time in, for me. Would you be enticed to go back into the co coaching job? Well, you never say never, but um, at the moment, I don't have any inclination to that way. Um, I feel I've done my stunt. Um, as I said earlier, I wanted to, to do it, um, to give it a go, and I gave it 10 years. And But as I say, you never say never, you never know.
Yeah, former Cork manager and player Billy Morgan, a man with strong views both on and off the field. We'll be hearing more from him a little bit later on. That's after we've seen highlights of the big game itself. Our commentary team at Parky Keith this afternoon was an old Cork affair. Jerry Canning and Tony Davis. And the referee, Brendan O'Gorman, just waiting for the nod to make sure that everybody is right and it's half past two. And the 112th Monster Football Final gets underway. Cork won the toss. They opt to play from left to right in the first half. Michal O'Sullivan going down straight away. Clumsy clash there with Edon McGarrell from Unhueltert. Some holding. Free into court, 20 metres out. Doing the holding was Mossy Lyons. Sean O'Gorhalpine would love to be playing. He's been out with a long-term injury. Colin Corkery from Nemo Rangers to kick this one. Scorer of a goal and eight points last year on his comeback to the championship trail. That's a good start for the big man. Cork on front. Corkery getting their first score. This is Darrell Shea. Cork looking eager, eager as you'd anticipate. Rank outsiders. Kieran O'Sullivan belting it in towards Fionnall Murray. The man with the goal touch. He scored more goals than points in championship football so far. Decent pass ahead. They play it on the ground still. Opportunities and Cork have gone into the very, very firmest position. And it is Joe Kavanagh who's got the goal. There are only four minutes gone. What a start for the challengers. Murray made it, Kavanaugh finished it, and there was nothing O'Keefe could do. And Kerry have not started yet. Daly playing it away out here to the effective Eldon McGarrett. Scored two goals in 99 in the first half and was substituted in the second half. Crowley playing it back. Daly coming through, back to Crowley once more. They look for another score, and they get it. John Crowley from Glenflesk. Kerry's first point from free, from, uh, from play rather, the yellow was from a free. Good combined play, nice coordination. They knew exactly what they were doing, great assurance about the final effort. Point for Kerry. McGarrett inside here to Tom O'Sullivan. Forward once again to Dolan Daly. He's been busy in the early minutes. Canelli is just ahead of him. Here he is, trying to go by Sexton. McGarrett once again. Difficult ball over there, but they managed to get it back to initially Okineda and in the end it's Mike Frank Russell and the lone Rangers man kicks a beautiful point and Kerry have now got three points on the board. They've come back well and they've scored the last three points. He'll be happier. Yeah, super score by, by me, Michael Frank. They'll be looking for Michael Frank to be looping around on the outside all day and trying to tick off those points. Oh, and Sexton. And he took too long about that, and it's going to be a free in for Kerry. Referee explaining it to Sexton, who comes from Kilbritton. Out there on the Costa del West Cork. Much he could do about that, Crowley was on his back. Exactly, that's a funny decision there by the referee. Here's the man from Ongwelthacht, Darrow Kineda. Another expert kick. He's going to take almost all of those chances, I'm certain, this afternoon. So if fouls are committed, it's pointless within 30, 35 metres of goal. Crowd settling down to a right good contest. A point between them. Down towards Okineda, operating in the corner right now, dragging Canty across with him. Young player Graham Canty is in the young 21 team. That's a great catch. Beautifully struck high. And that is Noel Canelli. And that's over. The Kerry flags flying defiantly behind the goal, heralding that score, his first of the match, and Kerry have gone in front. First time they've been in front of the game. This was a beautiful catch inside here, in front of goal, got away from Kieran O'Sullivan, had the latitude, had the accuracy. Faulkner Collins fisting this one, but backwards. Morris Fitzgerald picking up, away by Daly. Inside towards Eldon McGarrett, he's got space outside, he's got Fitzgerald on his right if he wants to use him. Fisted inside brilliantly, Daly's made the run, he's a goal chance. Transferred inside, great stop by Kevin O'Dwyer and it's from Dara Okineda. It was a great sweeping movement by Kerry. Their forward line in full flight, 
lots of variation. They could have kicked a point any time there. They went for the goal inside. It was a tight angle, and Odoar did well. Okineda trying to measure it. He's got it right. It's over the bar. Kerry lead by two points here at Fort Equive in the Bank of Ireland Munster Football Final. Here's Brendan Sher O'Sullivan taking that extra little bit with it. Tomas O'Shea is after him. Inside to Corkery. Being given a bit of latitude by Moynihan. And when that is given, that's the end product. And the teams are level. Third time the sides have been level. And a real tour of the force here by Colin Corkery. Two points from play, three from freeze. And Seamus Moynihan is having to give second best here. I'm sure Paddy O'Shea will be worried. Colin Corkery is in form towards Mike Frank Russell, won it brilliantly, taking on Michal O'Donovan, checking back, waiting for McGarrow to come, that's down there where he got the two goals in 99, it runs loose, Anthony Lynch does a little solo, in the end decides to belt it downfield, beyond O'Sullivan, Brendan Jer. so many O'Sullivans playing on this court team, Sexton's made a good run from centre half back up to the 40, transferring it back to Brendan Jer. Cork trailing. Sexton coming through. Colin Corkery saying, Give it to me. He's in great form today and he's put it over the bar. There's one between them. Cork's hero is Colin Corkery. So very close to the end of this first half. McGarrett fly kicking that one. Picked up by Michal O'Donovan. Out it comes here to Joe Cavada. Inside to Corkery. Cork's here over the first half. Good ball inside towards Clifford. Takes it in there against Michael McCarthy. Is this to be the equaliser on the call of half time? It's a kick by Clifford and it's gone over the bar. It's his first point. Good work by Philip Clifford. Score just one point against Clare was omitted for the start of the match against Waterford, but he's back here, and he took his chance here, as half-time is sounded by the referee. Good work by Clifford, good work by both teams, and at half-time, it's Cork 1-8, Kerry 11 points. It really is exciting. Mike Frank Russell popping up on the left this time. Daly's available, 45 metres out from the target. They bypass Johnny Crowley initially. Has it second time of asking from Kennelly. That's a fine kick. And this is a tremendous performance by John Crowley. The Glenn Flesman has got four points from four shots at the target. And he has pushed Kerry back in front by one point. A stirring contest. Full credit to both teams. Fatna Collins making some headway. But then, kicking it into space, can Murray take it? He can. Beating Mossy Lyons. Down goes Fionn Murray. Another chance to curl this one in. He deserved that one because he's played well. But that's only his first point. And everyone of Cork's inside forward line has now scored. Between them, they've scored eight points. Here's Sarah O'Shea and Cork of a player down on the ground. Larry Tompkins is protesting, play continues, Kerry attack, Johnny Crowley trying to get into a scoring situation, getting away from Lynch, outside it comes here, Daly's coming through, oh, it's blazed over the bar. And Larry Tompkins is on the field here and he really is annoyed with the referee, and the linesman has spotted it as well, but play was allowed to continue and Donald Daly got in for a point. Sure, the referee would want to get a hold of this game now because when Curry got the point there, the umpire or the sideline man had his flag up, and there was a few instances in the first half where people feel aggrieved by some of the decisions he's made. He'd want to get in control of this game now. Darrow Shea being spoken to. He's protesting his innocence and he gets away with a yellow. He's furious. It bounces into the arms of Dara O'Shea. Tom O'Sullivan, opportunities to make some headway. Down towards Mike Frank Russell, popping up on the right-hand side this time. Taking on O'Donovan. Still Mike Frank Russell. 
playing inside beautifully. Brosnan's shot comes stumbling off the goalkeeper. It's gone over the bar. A brave piece of goalkeeping, but a point for Kerry nonetheless by the substitute, Owen Brosnan from Dr. Crokes. He might have had a goal there. He was in a very good position, and Kerry have a three-point lead, 15 points to 1-9. Philip Clifford. Back to Kieran O'Sullivan. Likes to attack, but sometimes leaves gaps when that happens. Colin Corkery shooting. And that looks a nice one, and it's over the bar. He's the one man who really is turning it on consistently. Give him decent ball. And you credit Philip Clifford for getting low the last time to make that possible, to get the ball in. And it breaks to Darrow Shea. He's picked up so much ball. He's got everything in midfield. Here's Moynihan. Going by Faulkner Collins, who's labouring somewhat in midfield. Mike Frank getting away from Mihola Donovan once again. These are crucial areas of the pitch right now, where Kerry are in the ascendancy. Canelli winding himself up for the strike. Kevin O'Dwyer coming out. Broken ball. Crowley reacting. Feeding it to a better place colleague, who's Eadon McGarrett, and it's over the bar. Far on well for the shot, Eadon McGarrett. And there's some Kev Kuleen Fafta against the clay shot. Good ball inside, transferred well to Aidan Dorgan. Tom O'Sullivan trying to get back old side. Dorgan taking it on the break and kicking it well and kicking it over the bar. A point separate the teams. Dorgan gets his first of the day. A crucial one at a crucial time. Just about three minutes of normal to time to go. Derek Kavanagh. Kerry back slip. Brendan Gerald Sullivan with a mighty effort has put it over the bar. One point separating the teams again. Brendan Ger from Adrigal has made it 17 points to 113. There's a lot of football to be played yet in this year's championship. Dennis O'Dwyer. Indeed, it's William Kirby who took that one. Two minutes of added time to be played on top of the two minutes are there about still to go here. So you can count it down. Four minutes remaining. Can he add to his eight points? That's the angle and distance. It's going away left. Still kept in play. Mike Frank Russell. Ooh, that could have flown into the top of the net, but it's gone over instead. And Mike Frank has got a second point for Kerry at a critical time in this match. He might easily have got a goal, you know. Now that the goalkeeper managed to get a touch to it as it came spilling out here to Mike Frank Russell. I thought it was headed for the top there. Yes, I think he just did. We're in injury time. A minute and a half to play. Only a goal will win this for Cork. But it's Kerry who had possession. They have a chance to tap on another point here. Dennis O'Dwyer coming into the frame. This is a chance, Crowley's just ahead of him, and there's a trip. It's by O'Donovan, I think. It, just because it's at the very end of the match, I think he's very lucky, because having had a yellow already, he could have picked up a second yellow here. It's left to Dara Okineda to kick Kerry into a three-point lead with his ninth point of the afternoon. All over Kerry, they'll be celebrating, I'm sure, feeling that they have won. It's all over. Kerry retain the Bank of Ireland Monster Championship. And this is the margin. Three points. 19 points to 113. Seamus Moynihan from Glenflesk lifts the Monster Cup. And Kerry are the champions. It was a great atmosphere, ideal conditions for, for football. Maybe a little bit skeety in the first 10 minutes, all right. But, uh, you know, we're delighted with the result. And uh, as I say, we're looking final. We are look we're also very happy that we are not availing of the back door, that we go right into the quarter final. We trained very hard for, for today. I mean, uh, we, we were, our performances up to here now weren't, weren't great. But um, we'll take it on to the draw tonight and uh, whoever we get. And we'll prepare properly for it. And uh, you know our season hasn't ended yet, so we're we're going to keep driving on. You know, uh, I've never seen that like the referee in decisions over the last two years. Uh, I feel like that. You know, this team has has proven his worth, and, and it's just unfortunate we're not monster champions tonight. That's not taken away from Kerry. They're a good side. Um, you know, we weren't rated today, which is unbelievable. Um, 
But as I said, you know, that's, that's life, I suppose. We're back in the All Ireland, that's some little consolation. But as I said, it just annoys me. You know, it annoys me when I put in so much work and the lads put in so much work. And you come here and you get those decisions, which is, you know, it's not fair. It's not fair. So says Larry, well, it was close to be sure. Cork certainly got off to the right start, but Kerry steadied themselves to take control of yet another monster final. Analysis of that game coming up shortly. But first, let's head back to Parky Keeve to hear Billy Morgan's final thoughts on the match. The Munster team met this morning and uh, the Munster 1978 team and the Munster Council honoured us, gave us two free tickets for the match, which was very welcome. So I came down here then with a few old friends, John Cairns, Coleman Corrigan, uh, met a few of the lads in the stand. Uh, so we watched the game together. Uh, as regards the game, because it was a very good game of football, I think Cork were very unlucky um, going, going away, going home with, without at least a draw. Um, I think the referee will have free holidays in Kerry for the rest of his life and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to see what Pat's plans has made about Colin Corkery because Colin Corkery certainly gave him his answer there today. It was a great game, um, I enjoyed it. Uh, the only disappointing aspect, as I said, is that Cork last, but we're not out of the All-Ireland yet and maybe next Saturday uh, we can turn th things around. Yes, yeah, so Billy is disappointed. Kerry are the champions. Let's hear from the panel. Joe Brawley, you felt watching the match. As I said a moment ago, it was close, but Kerry just always seemed to have that little edge on the game. I don't know necessarily about that. I think that ultimately it sort of turned into a sharpshooting contest between Crowley and uh, the man that Pat Spillan Spilan described as the fat man. <laughs> I think he said he was too fat to play football. I listened to his sort of apology earlier and it sounded a bit like Bill Clinton's apology. But I mean, Corkery was magnificent today and the difficulty was that although Kavanagh, there was a few he camp you know, cameos, he scored a great goal, you know, typical of, of him. But it seems to be that when he, when he scores a brilliant goal, Cork lose, like the 1993 final and uh, the 1999 final against me. Brilliant individual skill, but not a 70-minute contribution. And that's the problem with Joe, there's never a 70-minute contribution. Mm -hmm. And really, Cork, he was left to go it alone. And as the match went on, the ball going in was becoming more and more sporadic. The, both Cork and the midfielders were yeah. taken off and Darrow Shea was in control. But, I mean... I mean, if, uh, I think that it, it'll surely be, uh, again to use Spillane's word, a, a morale boost to, to, to fat people to see that not only did Corkery do so well today, but Geoffrey McGonagall in, in, in the North scored 1-8 in Derry's victory in the Ulster final. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the referee, I felt anyway, I, I would agree to an extent with Tompkins, was crucial in, in the outcome, you know, given a series of easy frees and vital times. Yeah, well, in actual fact, you know, we've had some calls on that particular thing and some emails as well. Sean Tompkins in County Wicklow said that he felt five or six frees had gone to Kerry that he felt weren't frees at all and he thought the referee was unfair. And we heard what Larry had to say about them there as well. Well, I think that's right. In the first half, he gave three frees that I counted that weren't frees at all, all of which give simple frees to Daryl Kanaja, who really did, did little else apart from his frees. But, I mean, he's, he was flawless on the freeze. Three in the first half and three in the second half, which weren't freeze at all. And, c in fact, the two vital freeze that pushed Kerry two points ahead and then three points ahead, you know, coming into the last few minutes, were not freeze at all, in my view, and could be described as soft freeze. Now, whatever the reason for that was, I don't know. But it's right to say that when the fat was in the fire, the, the referee's sort of decision-making was questionable. And I, I think, certainly, you should give the benefit of the doubt in those circumstances. Tommy Lyons, that's not taking it all, obviously, from Kerry's win. They seem to be coasting along nicely again, doing the right things all the time. Yeah, I like the, the cheeky smile on Paddy's face there in the interview. I think Paddy is very happy, you know, and, and I think, you know, it's a big game for them. It's their first real test in the championship. They've passed it, they've won. Um, and I think, you know, they've a lot of very good footballers. There's a lot of you know, conditions were greasy today. It wasn't easy kick points today, and, and I thought they did a very good job. They're comfortable. They're sitting there now waiting in the Ireland quarter final. Mm -hmm. All right, gentlemen, thank you for that. Now, before we leave this afternoon's Monster Football Final, we come to our Man of the Match selection from that game. The choice was Kerry's classy corner forward, Johnny Crowley. Well, he contributed four points to Kerry's cause this afternoon, some of those scores at vital times in the match. Joe Canning had the Galway Crystal Trophy at the ready after the match to make the presentation. John, we're absolutely delighted for you. Congratulations to the Sunday game, man of the match. It was a wonderful contest. Uh, it was a great game. I'd say, you know, I was up and down all the time. So it's hard to judge when you're playing, but I mean, it seemed to be point for point, you know, and uh, Cork got off to the dream start, I suppose, and you know, we knuckled down and just got back with them. It was point for point after that. Did it disturb you that you were such hot favourites going into this match? I could barely find a paper that tipped Cork. 
Um, I suppose it doesn't help. I suppose you know you can close your ears as, as much as you want, like you know. But I suppose it doesn't help, you know. But we knew, like we were. Under, it was only two years ago when we came down here and got hammered, like out the gate. So we knew we were under no illusions about coming down here, like you know. But you know, at the same time, I suppose Cork were out to prove a point, and, and, and they certainly did that, you know. I mean, with Martin Cronin's long ball, you know, you could see that going to the back of the net there at the end, like you know. But I mean, we we just held out, fortunately. Okay, now at this point we'll take a commercial break. However, there's still lots to come here on the Sunday game tonight. The Leinster football final for one thing and draws a plenty. The next round of the football qualifiers and the All-Ireland Harding quarterfinals. So stay with us. Rewarded. On the other hand, Aoife O'Connell says, well, I must say today's Monster Final was refereed very well. It needed to be. And on the subject of play, she says, Kerry looked like a championship side, but Cork put too much pressure on Colin Corkery. And another Aoife, Aoife Cassidy, had this to say about the Leinster Final. I felt outraged watching it. It wasn't football. It was like scrapping in a schoolyard. If such scuffles had occurred in Ulster football, the attitudes of the referee and the panel would have been very different. And on a different subject altogether, the Hurling quarterfinal draw. Aidan Ryan says, I am deeply disturbed to find out that the All-Ireland Hurling quarterfinal draws are open. I find it totally ludicrous that Galway could draw the Ulster champions and possibly stroll into an All-Ireland semi-final with no first division opposition. One score separated all five participating teams in Munster this year. And Munster's reward for knocking lumps out of each other is to watch Galway possibly awarded a bus pass into the semi-finals. Oh yes, does Aidan know something we don't? We'll find out later on. Plenty of business still to be done here on the programme, including the draws for those football qualifiers and indeed the Harding quarterfinals. For the moment though, we refer back to this afternoon's Leinster final. Tommy Lyons was at that match today. Tommy, I felt that Dublin, despite losing the match, played one of their better games for years in the championship. Which I suppose is a compliment to me as well. Yes, indeed it is. I mean, Dublin have had the easy part of the draw over the last three years, and uh, they were expected to get to the Leinster finals every, over the last three years. But they certainly played with a great spirit today. They were they were obviously very up for the game, and you know, at the end of the game, if they if they felt that Cole McGoggins and Paddy Christie were going to hold Garrity and Murphy to a goal and a point of each, a total of four points, they would have taken that before the game. Sure. I thought Kieran Whelan delivered in the second half when it was really put up to him, and I thought Desi Farrell, another one of the old guys, you know really delivered a massive game for Dublin today and it, it, it's amazing how did Dublin lose well I suppose in the end of the day they lost because of their, their bad wides in the last 10 or 15 minutes and yeah. you know we, 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 we looked at some of those wides and like you know when, 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 when the heat of battle was on you know this is, a ba this is the one bad Miss Desi missed today but you know Desi had a very good game Johnny McGee running straight through should have gone for a simple score stupid pass into the goalie um, you know, another, another Paul Curran attempt, I think it hit the post, it went wide. The bottom line is they missed, missed the score. Colin Moore straight in front of the goals, bad wide. Players were panicking, you know, when they were getting the chance, they were just panicking to take the, take the chances. Mm. And this is an easy free, really. At this level of football, you expect to get these. I was surprised to see Colin Morden actually kicking those threes today. Yes. Because Colin Morden, you know, is a young man. I thought Desi Farr would have probably taken the, the, the responsibility a little easier on his shoulders. And Desi's well able, as we know, to kick threes sure. with his left foot. So, you know, Dublin will be disappointed to have lost that game. Yeah, but I suppose, Tommy, it has to be said as well, you know, that Mead were the All-Ireland champions just a couple of summers ago, mm -hmm. and they have been the most consistent team in Leinster in the championship, I suppose, over the, the past number of years. Yeah, they are, and, 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 and they're very strong in the defence. They hit you awful hard. You know, it, it's, it's right on the line of, 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 of the hitters, and it's really, God, they, you know, they put Dublin forwards back four or five yards today at times. And like, when, when, when push came to shove, they gambled on McDermott today. McDermott was awful poor in the first 35 sure. minutes, and it looked like it was backfiring. Yeah. But mother of God, whatever he had at half time, he came out and he was just <laughs> unbelievable. Two spoons of sugar in his tea. Oh, I don't know, whatever <laughs> juice Sean gave him. But I mean, he was just unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. He caught a ball today in Crow Park as good as we've ever seen. He was two foot above everybody. Joe Bradley, what did you think of it all? Well, I mean, I think that uh, Dublin, their tactics were pretty good. I wouldn't have placed McGee at left half back because he looked all at sea and out of position in the early stages, and Evan Kelly was getting a lot of free room and he took advantage of it. But, I mean, they decided instead of bringing Sen and Connell back in front of the full back line, which I would have done, they brought Colin Moran back, which was questionable use of a sure. forward like Moran who can score. But it totally took 
Garrity and Murphy out of the game. Now, Dublin had rightly uh, planned for this because they, they realised they'd been murdered two years ago and after the awfully experience the last day, they, they knew they needed protection in front of their full back lane. So as a result, Murphy and Garrity were gone out of the game. Garrity scored the goal after a minute because the keeper dropped the ball and Murphy got one point. But there's Meath for you. Mm. The lesser yeah. lights take up the slack. Richie Keeley scores a goal. Uh, Kelly scores three points. Donald Curtis scores a great point when the mm. fat's in the fire. And the thing about them, and we've discussed it before so many times, is they find a way to win. Trevor sure. Giles was very quiet from play, but he kicked seven or eight frees, never missed a free, absolutely cool. And they stay calm, they retain their composure, and with far less possession than the dubs, they still find a way to win, even with their three key men being kept out of the game. So can, can I pick up on another uh, aspect of today's game? Because this refers back to some of the comments of the emails that we mm. got, and it's a point that you want to pick up on, Tommy Lyons, because you're not entirely happy with the level of sportsmanship in Gaelic games generally this summer. Yeah, I think the sportsmanship from the players, I think they, they, they've started asking themselves questions. I think there's an awful stupid handbagging going on. Here, I mean, what is, is, is Darren Holman going in there? You know, you see Cormac Murphy coming in another minute later, taking somebody else out, you know. It's, it's just absolutely, nobody's, nobody's doing anything. It's yeah. handbagging. And here's Graham Garrity uh, looking, demanding for Paddy Christie to be booked. Now, Paddy Christie deserved to be booked because he had fouled him three or four times. We had the Ray Keneally incident, you know, where, 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 where your man... Oh, the Donald, Connacht final. Yeah, yeah, the Connacht final. He dived. and It's gone on a lot. We had it in Kildare Sligo. I just don't like it in the game. It's hard enough for the referees, and they're being much criticised. But it's very hard to decipher a dive from a, a, a real issue. And, and I think, you know, if we can get back to players taking responsibility first and foremost, mm. you know, they are on the pitch. Yeah. And it would make the job of the referee a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. and, and I do believe that the referees have been a bit better this year. The one thing I'm critical of the referees is when the box is thrown, they're not shown the red card. Mm. And it's happened today in the Munster Champion. When there was boxes thrown, the red card should come out. Yeah. There's no room for it whatsoever yeah. in the game. But do you reckon the players obviously also have to play their part as well in all this? They have a very part. big responsibility, Michael. Well, just one last point on, on the moving of Colin Morton back before uh, in front of the Dublin full back line. No team that I know of have won a game devising that tactic. Yeah. It, because yeah. what it does is it creates an extra defender at the far end and it creates a bottleneck. Yeah. It does stop the other team from playing, but you still but have you to go out the other You've got to go out and win yeah. the game as well. All right, Tommy Lyons, Joe Brawley, thank you very much. Now, our final piece of business relating to this match is our selection of Man of the Match. The award for this year's big game in Leinster goes to Meads, Evan Kelly. Well, apart from scoring three points in the match, Kelly was always a tireless worker up and down the field and indeed in an energy-sapping match. His appetite for work certainly was impressive. It's a great pleasure indeed to present the RT Man of the Match for the Leinster Football Final to Evan Kelly. Thank you very much, Marty. Three points in the Leinster Football Final and a, a Leinster medal as well. Well, the medal is all I came up for. Uh, the three points is a bonus and this is obviously icing on the cake, really. Um, it doesn't get any better than this. To beat Dublin, score three points and pick up Man of the Match award. It's, it's a great feeling. You've been improving all through the summer. Yeah, we, we struggled uh, to get over Westmead in the first game, but uh, that, that sort of broke the ice for us, and uh, the last day we played well against Kildare. It's very hard to say how we play today when you're involved, but I'm sure it was a tense enough game to watch in the sideline, and we're just happy to have the silver going home. Well, tell the other counties left in the All-Ireland series, Meath obviously are focused on this All-Ireland. Yeah, we're as, we're as hungry as we've ever been for success. We've, we've tasted it before, and uh, we want to taste it again. We set out at the beginning of the year to beat Westmead in the first game and try and win back our Leinster crown. We have achieved that now, and uh, whatever happens from now on is a massive bonus. OK, now we still have some more action to come here on the programme. Highlights from this afternoon's Ulster Hurling final between Down and Derry. But right now, though, it's draw time. The moment has come to see what the further fate of the counties in the qualifying rounds in football is going to be. Now, once again, to introduce proceedings, it's over to Tracy Belay. Yes, hello again. We're back for our fourth draw in the Bank of Ireland All-Ireland Football Qualifier. And this time, the teams we draw will be playing each other for quarter-final places. As you can see, we're back to having two bowls on the table. That's because the eight teams involved are divided into two distinct groups, and each of them will be drawn against someone in the other group. In Bowl 1 are these four counties, the ones who have won their third round qualifier matches. They are, of course, Derry, Galway, Sligo and Westmeath. And in Bowl 2 are the names of the four beaten provincial finalists. Two of these teams only became known today, of course, from the matches at Porky Creeve and Cook Park. And to make the draw, I'm joined once again by Des Crowley from the Bank of Ireland and Sean McCaig 
Uthron, Common Loot Class Gale, you're both very welcome. Thanks, Thanks for this, So, let's get underway. Des is going to draw from bowl one. They are the third round winners, and Sean will draw from bowl two, the provincial final losers. Okay, let's get going. First out, we have Westmeath. Westmeath. Having a brilliant run in the championship fantastic, this year. Fantastic, yeah, fantastic. Big excitement from Westmeath to see who is coming out of this one. And it's Mayo. Second out, we have Galway. Galway. Big Western representation in this in these drums. And Galway meet Cock. Big game. Big game. Next out, out Sligo. Sligo. Still on a high arc, that one from victory over Kildare. Absolutely. And this time we'll be trying to repeat that performance when they meet. Dublin. Oh, big okay. game. Finally, we've got Derry. Derry. Let's see who's left in here. Oh, the Breffney Blues from Cavan. So, a quick recap then on the draw. Westmead will face Mayo. It's Galway and Cork in a real big one. Sligo to face the might of the dubs and the all Ulster clash of Derry and Cavan. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Joe uh, Broly, got to go to you first, Derry and Cavan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't say I was begging for it. <laughs> no, I think that, uh, I mean, I was talking to some Cavan people down at the game where, where the last qualifier down in uh, Breffney Park. And they were saying, we, we pray if we get beaten tomorrow that we don't meet Derry. And, you know, there's been a history in the last few years of Derry, you know, giving out huge tankings to Cavan. Yeah. I think that they, after Cavan's performance in the Ulster final, and Derry have not been going well. They've got through the qualifiers very quietly. A Derry man said to me recently, thank God RTE haven't sent any of the cameras to the matches <laughs> we've played. And Derry haven't been going that well, but I think, you know, of all the games, I mean, I had a feeling in my bones, I must say, that we'd draw the dubs. And that, of course, would have been the great glamour clash from our point of view. The last time we played, there was an 83 in the semi final. Yeah. But I think that, you know, Eamon Coleman will at, at least feel that, that, that Derry have a reasonable prospect against Cavan, you know. And, and uh, you know, Derry, I think, you know, should have, should have the power for Cavan. OK, we just have to make the point as well, by the way, that uh, the venues for these matches won't be decided, or indeed the dates. It will be played next weekend, some on Saturday, some on Sunday. Uh, dates and venues to be decided on Monday by the GEA. Tommy Lines, let's come to the other games that we have there. Next one, uh, let's go to the top of the list, Westmead and Mayo. That'll be interesting. Yeah, Westmead and Mayo, it's certainly, it's, it's, it's a great draw for, 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 for Westmead. I think, you know, they would see themselves as Mayo being carrying a favourite tag there and, and going in there giving a right lash. Westmead have been the form team, really, in, in this year's championship. Unluckily beaten by Mead, you know, did well in the qualifiers to yeah. sneaking away there in the QT. Mayo shattered after the kind of sure. final loss, absolutely shattered. You know, there wasn't a, a child in Mayo that wasn't shattered after yeah, that. Yeah. And, and, you know, but they've had enough of time, you know, they've, they, they should be able to have regrouped. I think that's going to be a cracker, that's going to be well worth going to see. Talk to me about Galway and Cork. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I, I, think, I, think, I think John O'Mahony and Larry Thompkins are both after choking on their pints when, when they saw that one coming out because both teams, I'd say, would have wanted to avoid each other uh, yeah. because they would be, to me, the two farm teams going, going into this Where are they going to play that? Going to play that in Grove Park? Oh, I think it'd be standing room only, Michael. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and uh, I think, you know, Galway got through Armagh the last day, were coasting, nearly got caught. Learned a lot. Mm. Learned a lot. I think they're going to have a different team out this year than last year. By the way, just, just to make a point on that, it's mm. unlikely that game will be on the Saturday. If Galway have anything to do with it, Sean O'Donnell, uh, Galway's midfielder, is getting married next Saturday. So presumably he'll say, well, listen, I won't be there anyway for one. Yeah, there'll be a lot of Galway supporters. I won't say that. But anyhow, um, you know, the <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I, I don't know. I, I think, I think <laughs> Joe's finally tweaked, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I think Tommy Lyons is <laughs> waiting <laughs> gift. Yeah, uh, I think Cork um, uh, were not bad today. They depended on Cork a lot today, and ironically, Cork scored eight points. Not more than Pat Blaine ever scored in the Munster Championship match. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I think if a few more Cork players play with Colin Cockery, they're going to really put it up to go. But I think that's the game to go to see. Yeah, I suppose 
Joe Brawley, the game between Sligo and Dublin, there's an intrigue now about this, isn't there? there is. Dublin have only a week to prepare. We know what difficulty that's caused in the past. Sligo, last visit to Croke Park against Kildare. Yes, yeah, Sligo have thrown a cat among the pigeons. I mean, they played, a, they played a great match against me when they really deserved in every sense to win that match and they threw it away themselves and particularly slowing at corner forward, but he more than made up for it against Kildare. And they're a good side. They play the game well. There's good teamwork. They have plenty of passion, and Ford has them well motivated. You can see all that crispness of passion yeah. and all that, that's the Mickey Moran trademark. And now you can see that steel in the way they're playing. As against that, it's still the dubs, and it's going to be sure. Croke Park very likely, and it's a huge ordeal for them. But, you know, the dubs are not by any means the finished article. The dubs threw everything into that today, played very passionately, and still weren't good enough to win it, even though Meath had an off day. So it could be very tight indeed, but you would expect with the whole dubs thing in Croke Park that the dubs must squeeze through that. But I would say they'll squeeze through it. I mean, I don't think that they have ability, the, the ability to do anything more than that. In four words from each of you, who are the four winners out of that draw? Tommy Lyons. Derry, Dublin, Galway and Westmeath. Derry, Dublin, Galway and Westmeath, says Tommy Lyons. Joe Brawley. Yeah, I'd strongly fancy Westmeath, uh, Galway, Dublin and... Uh, and maybe Derry. Cavan, I suppose, sure, yeah. Uh, Derry after extra time, I think, <laughs> against Cavan. <laughs> okay, so say the experts. You've heard it all here. Next here on the programme, we're going to turn our attention to Harding. Now, shortly, we'll have the draw for the quarterfinals of the Harding Championship. But this afternoon... Desi Farr with Paul McMurphy on his shoulder from Farrell, showing his vast experience. Trying to jink inside him, not easy. There's nobody in around the house except uh, Jason Sherlock. And the referee has given the free to Dublin, despite the furious protestations from Meath. I thought Meade defended that situation very well and Desi was somewhat lucky to get the free and I thought it may have been a free out for overcarrying but fair play to him if he got it he certainly earned it. So far Colin Morton has had two attempts, one successful, this is his third and this is over the bar. Second point of the game for the Bally Bolton St. Enders 21 year old. Two points between the sides. A huge battle ahead in this second half of this Leinster Championship final. Fabulous catch by McDermott. Ian Robertson came in off the ball, by the way. McDermott spoke for this signal to the referee. Did he see that? It is, however, a free to me far side. Trevor Giles. Very much the Mr. Consistent as Sean Boylan, who of course is in his 19th championship season with me. A remarkable achievement. This is Trevor Giles' first free. It's certainly not nice to hear all this booing and whistling for what is a fabulous footballer. Giles, not really put off by the uh, taunts. Here's Ali Murphy who grabs the ball and sends it over the bar. That's his first point from four attempts. He registered three wides in the first half, but Ali Murphy is always so dangerous. Yes, and you must credit Coleman Goggins the way he's having a, a very good game, a very good marking job on Nolly Murphy. But that time, Murphy's change of feet and, and the way he was able to swivel and put that over the bar was a delight to look at. Davy Byrne sends it down the middle. Colin Moore releases Kieran Whelan on another one of these penetrating runs. Nigel Crawford chasing after him. Great run by Whelan! asleep for most of the first half he certainly has woken up because Kieran Whelan is undoubtedly in the centre of Croke Park. Oh very much he's making up for lost time in the first half and that was a lovely little ball flicked on by Colin Moore to him but he has great pace Nigel Lester was simply unable to keep with him that time as he went through. I remember two years ago 
Kieran Whelan had a great game against Mead. Usually uh, relishes the challenge. Darren Homer. Dublin surging forward now. Another Andrews thought about taking it quickly. Gives it to Holman, who has certainly taken the responsibility. That's a good ball down to his captain, Desi Farrer. Needs the support outside. Nobody there. Needs it over on the left wing. Nobody there. Has to turn. And that is over the bar. Desi Farrell scored two points against Offaly in the semi-final. He scored three, and there's still plenty of time in Croke Park. He looked around, a player of wonderful experience at this stage, and his experience was vital because there was nobody readily available. And by God, are the Hill responding at the moment. I haven't seen one like this in years. The kick forward goes over the sideline. That's going to be a line ball for me. Paul Shanky from Kilmain and Watt, club that produced Brian Stafford. Paddy Christie gets a touch, and it's a line ball for me. Trevor Ops for John McDermott. Or oh, carry just a little bit too much pace. Donald Curtis, left foot, solid, and over the crossbar. Brilliant point by Curtis. Made a reputation for himself in North Mead with Rackenny. As a halfback, then showed his flexibility by uh, turning into a forward. And that's his second point in this Leinster final. McDermott seemed to give away a shoulder charge, but uh, it looked possibly a frontal rather than a fair shoulder on Colin Moore. Well, certainly Colin Moore felt that, but I think he ran straight into McDermott yes. that time, actually. He teed himself up for it. But I must say, say the second half is so fluent, so free-flowing by comparison with what, uh, what we had in the first half. And some of the scores we're getting at the moment are of the highest uh, standard. Darren Homer, who has worked so hard in his game. And Sherlock is fouled. They feel in the Dublin inner circle that Jail, since he's concentrated on uh, Gaelic football, has improved by almost 50%, and his scoring rate is phenomenal. Particularly, uh, he's worked at a training at scoring points, and uh, sometimes attends training at half five and six o'clock when training might only be at half seven, just to, just to shoot scores. Yes, he's very busy out there. He's doing great work off the ball that maybe he isn't seen on camera. Doing very well. Right? That's a bad miss by Wayne McCarthy. Still only managing one score out of three attempts. Cormac O'Sullivan comes from the same area of uh, County Mead as uh, former Mead goalkeeper Mickey McQuillan from Stamullo. Jesse Farr orchestrating things now from centre half forward, looking for a loose player. A little touch from Darren Fay, put the ball astray. And it's Evan Kelly. Man of the match for Mead in the first half. That's a good ball to Graham Garrity. Ollie Murphy has gone inside. Coleman Goggins chasing him. Still Garrity. Great defending by Paddy Christie. Can he get a touch? Davy Byrne is loose. The ball is loose. Davy Byrne comes out. It's Garrity once more. And a wonderful defending by Shane Ryan. That's great defending by Dublin. Fantastic defending both by Paddy Christie and Shane Ryan that time and the way they got in front of Garrity. Garrity took them on from about 60 metres out, ran at them. What a wonderful piece of combined defence by the, all of the Dublin defenders, including their goalkeeper. The first 45 of the match is going to be taken by Trevor Giles. Made his debut in 1994 against Leash, and on his debut won the Man of the Match award. 
This is floating in. Well caught by Darren Holman. It's the same story of the first half in some ways. Kelly doing it for Meade, Holman doing it for Dublin. Nigel Nestor. Trevor Giles. Put it into the space, but there's nobody there. Paul Kern is anxious not to see it brought over the sideline. Here's the Shane Ryan. Under pressure from Donald Curtis. Sneaks it out first, Johnny McGee. Heather Andrews. Dublin looking a little bit more impressive now as Coleman Goggins goes away. Red running by the cornerback. Dublin uh, football circles that maintain Goggins will eventually be the centre half back for Dublin in time. At the moment, his cornerback initiating a move that now involves Wayne McCarthy. Mark O'Reilly staying with him. McCarthy gives it back out to Pater Andrews, who made a good run, hits it, and that is just gone to the right and wide. But very enterprising play by Dublin. Vinnie Murphy, will he be called into the side? And certainly his contribution in this championship has been immense. Is he now required? Richie Keeley. Murphy won't allow that uh, quickly taken free. As Richie had stepped forward 10, 15 metres or so. That could well turn out to be a throw ball. Nigel Crawford and Kieran Wheeler. Goes back to Richie Keeley. Good switch of play. Falcons gets a touch to it, but he touched the ball along the ground. And his anxiety to uh, win possession. Forced uh, the uh, ball along the ground, and that's going to be a free for me. Yes, he's having a great, a great tussle with Ollie Murphy at the moment. He's trying to get out in front of him. He won that ball a little bit unlucky, perhaps, to have been called for the free. Trevor Giles dropping this in under the cross, over the crossbar. Great score. Wonderful kick by Trevor Giles. Yes, what you have to admire about Trevor Giles, he might be in the game that much today. The game is very frantic around him, but he's very, very calm and composed whenever the ball is given to him for a free kick situation like that. And even when he gets uh, the ball in general play, very, very great presence of mind. With the change in personnel in the Dublin camp, Enda Sheehy is coming on, and the player that's going off is uh, full forward Ian Robertson, who started the second half at centre forward. to see. John McDermott is back for me. And all of Croke Park seem to respond to that great catch and he too is, is boosted by that old style of catching the ball. The ball is loose and cut out by Shane Ryan. Paul Curran uses Ryan on the overlap. McDermott claims that he just stood his ground, but the referee says no, and McDermott continues to protest. The free is taken by Endesheehy. Referee again spotted the foul by the main defender, and that's going to be a free for Dublin. Yes, I think in that, in that situation, Cormac Murphy probably had his arms around uh, the double player who got the ball, and uh, Michael Corley, I think, was correct in calling it. It may have been just a tactical switch to take off Ian Robertson and bring in Andy Sheehy. But, uh, what was being kept quiet was the fact that Ian Robertson fell on his knee uh, just recently and uh, seemed to be causing problems for him. Wayne McCarthy. Scored four points against Offaly, three of them for freeze in the semi-final. It's this, straight over, Cormac O'Sullivan's crossbar, 
for his second point. Two points between the sides. The response from Hill 16 seems to be that uh, Vinnie Murphy is what lining up, uh, warming up at the far side. And of course, Vinnie has been introduced in the game so far. And I'm sure it's only a matter of time before he arrives here on the pitch. That ball comes in. Cormac Sullivan calls for it. Steps aside the challenge and then gives it long down towards John McDermott. There are three Dublin players. And the is the fourth. Licks it out towards Paul Curry. Drops this one well wide and Paul will be disgusted with himself because there were several options available to him. Yes, I think Wayne McCarthy was a little bit disappointed that the ball wasn't that off to him there. He was in good space and Paul maybe was caught between two minds. But certainly there was a chance to narrow the gap. John Costello, the Dublin County Secretary, is giving a slip of paper to Vinnie Murphy. This is Dublin's third substitute, and Hill 16 gave the uh, club man from Trinity Gales a warm reception as Senan Connell makes way for him. Vinnie, the hero in the semi final, scoring two points, one of them from a three, and of course he also came on against uh, Longford and scored a great point. So Vinny takes up residency at full forward, going to be marked by Darren Fay. And it's Dublin once more. Johnny McGee sending it in. Towards guess who? Vinny Murphy floating this in, and Cormac O'Sullivan has the situation under control. Paul Current gets a touch to it. And that, I think, is the wrong decision. It was a clear effort to punch the ball away. He did so, as I saw it anyway, fairly. What do you think? Yes, I thought he played the ball that time. Certainly he made contact with the back of Evan Kelly, but I thought, to be fair, he attacked the ball and, and they free a little bit unlucky against, uh, against Dublin. The free comes to John McDermott. But defending by Paddy Christie. Shane Ryan immediately running off the ball for him employs Pater Andrews and Vinny is ahead of Darren Fay but he doesn't control the ball and it's an easy catch for the fullback from Trent John McDermott great block down by Wayne McCarthy and he's happy to boot it anywhere Mark O'Reilly has to go back to collect Cormac Murphy Sending it long towards Graham Garrity. Paddy Christie was pulling the jersey. And Graham Garrity is explaining to the referee that's the third or fourth time this has happened. And the referee has, in fact, noted Paddy Christie's name. The free quickly taken down towards Ali Murphy. Knocked back to Richie Keeley. Keeley, given a little bit of space, sends it to the left and wide. That's Meade's fifth wide of the game. This is fabulous football. Look at this by Wayne McCarthy. Blocking down John McDermott's kick. It must be noted actually that the Dublin defence in general is coping very well with the meat attack and making it very difficult for them to make any inroads at scoring. Again, it's John McDermott. Here on Whelan and Darren Coleman for a test. Once the player in possession wins that ball so spectacularly, well, I think the referee, most referees, give the free to that sort of skill. Richie Keeley in towards Nigel Nestor. The overlap provided by Keeley. He faces Byrne. John Shockland and Mead rejoice. Richie Keeley. Lashes on to a ball and gives Davy Byrne no chance. And for the second time this afternoon, the Dublin keeper has to take the ball out of the net. This time, no fault on Byrne. 
Great finish by Richie Keeley. That's a superb goal from a player who's played a lot of his football in the back line this year, and the assist there from Nestor that time would show great vision. Dublin haven't scored, by the way, in the last 15 minutes. Here there's an opportunity for a foul on Desi Farah. Wayne McCarthy again to take the free. Mark O'Reilly informing him of where the free should be taken. And the referee is now going across to the linesman at the far side. And John Geeney from Cork will tell him, I'm sure, exactly what happened and what Mark O'Reilly did. And he's brought the ball forward, an extra 10 metres. A much more scorable opportunity now for Wayne McCarthy. Five points between the sides. This should be a simple tap-over for Wayne McCarthy. Third point for the corner forward. Four points between the sides. This was some goal. And the finish by Keeling was superb. Knocks it away from John McDermott. Picked up by Colin Moore. The ball released quickly to Kieran Whelan. There's plenty of grass in front of him. Wayne McCarthy to his left. And Whelan blasts it over the bar. For his third point. And more entanglements and more off the ball stuff. This time, Vinnie Murphy is involved with Darren Fay and Mark O'Reilly. And all unnecessary. just checking and the umpires are changed to yes the umpires are just waving to him and saying referee Michael Curley you've just done what uh, is required just to assert his authority nothing major the kick out by Cormac O'Sullivan an easy sideline ball for Dublin. And the Sheehy. Pumping it in long towards Vinnie Murphy. Mark O'Reilly judged it perfectly. McDermott gives it long. Hank Trainer. A little bit of pressure from Darren Holman. Paul Curran. This possesses Nigel Crawford. And the Sheehy uses Darren Homer and Shane Ryan. It surges forward at every opportunity. Heather Andrews. Good play by Hank Trainer. Dublin playing it a little bit too tight. There's no green and gold jersey over that side except Paddy Christie. Darren Holman again. Wayne McCarthy. Desi Farr. Dublin have support. Desi goes at solo this time, and for once in this match, Farrell took the wrong option. Surprising the attack that preceded that Dublin one, that the Dublin team went so short. They have a very good target man in there at the moment in, in uh, Vinnie Murphy. Possibly should be letting the ball in along to him and let him contest the thing with Darren Clay. Evan Kelly picks up the loose ball. 
Graham Garrish, who for once gets away from Paddy Christie. And the referee has given the free. And Graham Garrish is furious over the decision. Well, it seems to be. The referee Michael Curley is going to have a word with uh, Paddy Christie. What I think he's doing actually is voicing his frustration and making the point that Christie is following him repeatedly. Oh, we can't see it possibly from here, but he feels that he's been held every time he goes for the ball. And maybe that's the cause of his complaint. A yellow card for Paddy Christie. It's two yellow cards now for Dublin, one for me. For his third point, Trevor Giles. Floats it over nicely. And Mead re established their four point advantage. Mead are going to make a change. Ray McGee who normally plays at corner forward, and uh, Donald Curtis, who has contributed two points, is the player that's going to make way. Obviously, Sean Boylan is uh, adopting a strategy whereby there's a little bit more pace now as players tire here in Crook Park. Darren Homer. Great catch by Jesse Farrell. He loses possession, picked up by Darren Fay. For McMurphy. This is Kieran Wheeler. Needs the support outside him. It's there. Johnny McGee. Flicking it over towards Colin Moore. Giving it a little bit of time. And space. And he sends it over the bar. That's his first from play. And third in total. And he really should be pumped forward into a more attacking role because he is a player in this Dublin attack that can actually score, and more importantly, score goals. Yes, he's worked very hard throughout the game, but possibly a lot of his work has been done on the wrong half of the field. Lead, lead by three points. And Dublin go forward again. This is a great run. Johnny McGee pumping it across and corner because Sullivan comes out. And gives it plenty of air. So much so that he found touch in front of the Mead dugout at the far side. It's not the pitch at the moment. Dolly Murphy and Coleman Goggins are the only two players in the Dublin half or in the uh, Dublin half of the field. Darren Homer tries to set up Jason Sherlock. The support players from Paul Curran tries for his second time at a point, and again it's well wide. It must be said, Marty, that Dublin have had great opportunities in the last 10 minutes to actually be level with me. That wide there from Paul Curran is the second one, but certainly in terms of endeavour, they're giving as good as they get. It's Dublin's ninth wide, but Paul Curran will certainly regret having that second attempt because uh, his shooting boots are obviously not on great catch by Father Andrews and it's Dublin again with the ball given away and Cormac Murphy intercepts Mark O'Reilly feeds Evan Kelly Paul Shanky and Shane Ryan for Dublin uses Johnny McGee. It's called by Ray McGee. And it's the Dublin McGee that wins the free. And Ray McGee being spoken to, and in fact being shown a yellow card. Keeling. Giving it back to Darren Fay. 
Well punched on. And it's Ali Murphy getting inside Coleman Goggins. Good defending by Goggins. Murphy has to hold and send it. Oh, that. Oh, I thought it was going over the bar. It looked like it from here. And Davy Byrne watched it and feeds Johnny McGee. Three points between the teams. Just over three and a half minutes in actual playing time. Desi Farr, Colin Moore in a good position. He feeds Moore, steps inside one challenge and then drives it wide. Dublin unable to open up the Mead full back line, but they are winning possession, but they're playing it in a very tight funnel. If they had just that little bit more composure in front of goals, just as in that case there from Coley Moore, they would be level if not ahead of Mead at this stage. They've had great opportunities in the second half to actually be ahead. Mead are living on scraps up at the far end of the field, and it has taken the two goals, one early in the game and one in midway through the second half to keep them in front. Just to confirm what you're saying, in fact, Martin Harney, that statistically Dublin have had ten wides in this match and Mead only five. Double the amount. And in the second half, double the amount of possession, I'm sure, as well. Sean Boylan. Bidding for his 51st championship success. The Hill 16 chant for their heroes, trying to inspire them now in the last three minutes of this Leinster football final. Two Mead players. John McDermott comes down with the ball and wins a free. Quickly taken by Trevor Giles. Paul Shanky to Ray McGee, Shane Ryan, just with one hand. And the referee gives the Mead substitute the free. And Mead will take all the time possible <laughs> that, in, uh, to execute this kick. Time is running out. And certainly this point here is, is vital to put four points between the two teams. Referee Michael Curley has been called over to the far side and in fact what he's doing is he's giving the information about the uh, injury time that's going to be played to John Geeney, the linesman, so we're going to be informed exactly what's going to be there uh, in just a moment. As the referee tells Ray McGee where the free is to be taken from. Two minutes extra time as McGee sends it over the bar. His first point, and at the end of the day, it could be extremely valuable. It stretches Meade's lead to four points. Statistically, Dublin have had more chances, 25 to Meade's 20. Referee very quickly in, just in case anything develops. This is going to be a throw ball. Darren Homan gives it long, very long. The goalkeeper, unsure, judges it correctly and knocks it down to Cormac O'Sullivan. Cormac Murphy. Good working by Desi Farrell. Nips in and wins possession when really he shouldn't have. Trying to come in from a difficult angle. Nigel Nestor is deemed to have been fouling him. So this is a free for Dublin to reduce Meade's lead to uh, just three points. It's a very difficult angle for Colin Moore. This across the face of the goal and wide. Disappointment for Colin Moore and Dublin, but perhaps for Sean Boylan. Leading Mead to another championship title. Dublin fans bewildered and worried. Having dominated.
hit so much of this second half. Is it enough to at least gain parity? The ball is touched along the ground, and that's going to be a free for Dublin. Who's going to go into the draw tonight in the Sunday game? The long ball is into no man's land from a Mead perspective. Paddy Christie gets it down first, Kieran Whelan. Those great runs of his will be uh, very much in everybody's minds. Win or lose. Wayne McCarthy brought down again. And it, once more, it's from a very difficult angle from a Dublin viewpoint. This time the foul committed by Mark O'Reilly. Kieran Whelan comes in as frustration increases in the Dublin camp. And referee Mick Curley has to take matters firmly by the scruff of the neck here and assert his authority and control. That's not a suit me fine. Clock is running down. Even if this goes over the bar, there's still a goal ahead. The referee Mick Curley is calling Mark O'Reilly, I think, out of a word, and he could become the third Mead player to be booked. The free for Colin Moore. This time, the white flag is raised, and Dublin reduce Mead's advantage. Three points between the sides, but time running out for Dublin. Is it about to be Mead's 20th Leinster Football Championship title? Cormac O'Sullivan, Mead goalkeeper in no rush, as the fans can hardly watch. Anxious to enjoy and savour a famous victory over the old enemy. Paddy Christie. Pumped in long. This is surely Dublin's last chance. Knocked away. Desi Farrell chases after it. They have to create a goal. It's still Desi. And it's another free from exactly the same position. But surely this time a point is insufficient. They have to try and engineer a goal. Roscommon did it against Mayo. And Dublin do it against me. He lobs it in high. Under the crossbar. It's still there. And the referee has blown his whistle. It's Meade's Leinster Championship title. It's Dublin that go into the All-Ireland qualifying draw. We've seen it before in the Championship campaign, but it's all about scoring goals sometimes. It's a cliché, but goals wins Championship matches. Tyrone did it against Derry. Mead have done it against Dublin. A goal by Graham Garrity in the first half. A second goal in the second half by Richie Keeley. A real peach of an effort ensured that Mead win their 20th title. Richie Keeley gets the plaudits from all and sundry. Nigel Nestor congratulates his county teammates. It was his goal that ensured victory here in Croke Park and certainly Mead well worthy of their victory. Yeah, well, Dublin actually played better than they have for quite a few years, and they had a huge amount of possession. You know, when you'd look on it, you'd say they should have won the match, but it was the two goals, and Richie Keeley's goal was a brilliant goal, great the way it was worked. Nigel Nestor got the ball in a, a very difficult position. Plenty of Dublin backs on. Slips a beautiful pass through left foot. Yeah, yeah there's no stopping that goal, you know. But uh, at that stage, you think Dublin would collapse. And instead of that, they fought back. I thought Dublin showed far better hunger and passion. Their shooting let them down 11 wides to 5. But no team on the other side of the qualifier would like to meet Dublin next Sunday because, they, you know, Dublin showed tremendous well, heart and character there today. This is very true, and at the end of the day, Pat, I suppose, they're picking one inside, but nonetheless, Graham Geraghty's goal, the little fumble by David Byrne, the Dublin goalkeeper, 
This was the difference between the sides We're in the back end, to score wise. We said it at half time, it could be probably the difference, and it was. One goal in it, like I said, and it was David Bur unfortunately David Burton's fault, and he'll have to hold his hands up. Like I said, Coleman Goggins had done all the right work. He had he had kept goal side of Ollie Muff uh, Ollie Muffin. Nothing looked on. It was harmlessly into the goalie's hands. I don't know what he was looking at, but he took his eye off the ball. And fair play to Graham Gerrity, you know, took his chance. And, like I said, you know, this was a performance by me, not playing well. There are five key players when he walk in patches. If you'd said that before the game, you'd say they have no chance. But Dublin, good spirit by Dublin, but at the end of the day, you know, they huffed and they puffed. This is simple football. This is the way me played, indirect, waiting for the breaks, taking the opportunities inside. In the second half, when Dublin had most of the possession, they carried it, they shot past, and that played into the meat, meat, meat defenders' hands where they easily crowded them out. Like I said, good spirit by Dublin, uh, good effort, probably the better team lost, but look, you have to credit meat. It's a simple game plan, it's a never say die spirit, and at the end of the day, they won. In a word, Colm Rook, do you think the better team lost? No, well, I, I think, <laughs> I think in, in Gaelic football, generally, it's a fair game. You know, Dub Dublin had their chances, and you'd have to say, this is really a throwback 20 years. When I started playing with Mead, it would be exactly the same thing. We'd beat Dublin up against the goals for the whole game and cut and score and they'd always take the handy chances. Yeah. I'm glad for Trevor Giles, a very modest man to be captain, and he'll be in better humour playing golf with him tomorrow. So <laughs> it's a good day all round. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Enjoy the golf tomorrow, by the way. That's it then from our live transmission. We're just... A reminder to you, of course, about our nighttime programme. We're on the air at 10 past nine tonight. Highlights of both matches. We also have the draw for those football qualifiers and the draw for the Harley quarterfinals in the programme as well. And we have our competition as well. So do stay tuned for all of that. A lot to cover tonight on the Sunday game. I hope you can join me. But from Pat, from Colin, for the afternoon. Thank you for watching. See you the next time.